Wow, good morning, good morning, good morning. Today is Wednesday, October 4th, 2023, and I am Kenny Polkar, your host of the party. And oh, is there so much to talk about today? And what is it that we need to know? What happened yesterday and what hap what's happening today? Well, chaos erupted on Wall Street as stocks plummet during the day. And then after the bell, chaos erupts in Capitol Hill, right? Kevin McCarthy gets kicked to the curb by all the Democrats plus eight Republicans. Treasury yields surge again. The 10-year is up 20%. The 10-year yield is up 20% since August. And the VIX, the fear index, that pushes higher as well. This is not the time to panic. And what are we having for dinner tonight? This one, we're going to have another spaghetti dish. It's spaghetti fini with leeks and pancetta. Mm. Delicious. I just feel like pasta. I don't know why. I think it just makes me feel good in chaotic times. Anyway, so it's rinse and repeat, right? The intensifying bond sell-off uh, that we've seen over the last couple of weeks sent Treasury yields surging again yesterday while igniting a round, a uh, new round of selling in equities, right? Yesterday's sell-off has now taken the Dow into negative territory, joining the Russell, which went negative last week. The losses yesterday were broad. They were seen in almost every corner of the market, with the exception of the utility sector, which has gotten absolutely crushed over the prior six trading days. So investors appeared to find some value in that group. But like I said yesterday, it's a shit show. Ten-year treasuries rose by double digits again on Tuesday. The ten-year now yielding 4.79%, up nearly 12 basis points. The 30-year jumped by 14 basis points and is now yielding, get ready, 4.92%. Just FYI, the last time the 30-year was teasing this level was back in April of 2006 to September 2007, just prior to the complete meltdown known as the GFC, or the Great Financial Crisis. The two-year jumped by five basis points, ending the day yielding 5.15%, uh, and a sudden push higher that has caught investors off guard. And like I said, when the market gets anxious, the path of least resistance is lower, right? And so stocks got whacked. I mean, really whacked. The Dow fell 517 points intraday before rallying a bit into the bell, ending the day down 431 points or 1.3%. The key index is now negative on the year, down four-tenths of a percent. The S&P was on its way to test the 200 at 4,200, but suddenly found support at 42.16, which is interesting because it's not really a level that should have been defended, right? 4,200 is. Ultimately, the S&P closed at 42.29, down 1.4%. The NASDAQ lost 250 points or 1.9%, which honestly, it's about time that they took some air out of that group. The Russell fell 30 points or 1.7%, taking that index down 2% year to date, while the transports gave back 115 points or 8 tenths of a percent. The dollar pushes higher as well, rising as much as 34 cents to kiss a high of 107.36 yesterday before settling back at 107.08. Remember, the next target there is 108. But this morning, the dollar index is trading just a bit lower as it appears to be digesting this recent spike higher. Currently, the dollar index is trading down 18 cents at 106.81, but I don't think for very long. Now, on Monday, it was the utilities that got smashed, right? Down 4.6%. Yet, they were the only stocks uh, uh, that bucked the trend yesterday, right? And rising by 1.2%. But remember, they've taken 13% out of that group in the prior six trading days, between last week and Monday of this week, suggesting that some investors are sniffing around for bargains as they sift through the sale rack. Yesterday, it was consumer discretionary that took it on the chin, down 2.4%, which is really not nearly enough. It's still up 22% on the year. And remember, we're talking about consumer discretionary stocks, not consumer staple stocks, right? Discretionary stocks are things that you like to have versus need to have, which is curious, especially if the economy is expected to hit some, uh, some bumps in the road, right? Some rocks in the road ahead. I would imagine that people are going to start to buy less of the things that they might like to have and more of the things that they need to have, right? Think food, detergent, soaps, Q-tips, shampoo, bleach, downy, dental floss, trash bags, right? You get the picture, right? Those are all staple stuff. Tech yesterday down 1.7, disruptive tech down 2.7, semis down 2%, cybersecurity down 1.8, robotics and AI losing nearly 3%. 
Then the financials, they got punched in the face as well, falling 1.6%. Communications lost 1.3%. That's another group that's still up 35% year to date. So expect to see that sector hit the skids if the mood goes from anxious to panic. Real estate down 1.8. Consumer staples were down 7 tenths. Healthcare down uh, 9 tenths of a percent. Basic materials down 3 tenths, while energy was essentially flat. It was off 1 tenth of a percent. And again, what is all this selling telling us today? Well, get ready for normal rates. Forget everything you learned over the past 12 years about zero rates. You see, rates at 5% are not, not normal. In fact, ask any baby boomer and you're going to realize that zero or even 2% rates are the ones that are not normal. 5% rates are, in fact, historically normal. But now the market needs time to adjust and investors need time to reacquaint themselves with history. The recent pullback is a bit shocking for sure, but you have to understand the recent surge in rates has happened at lightning speed. 10 year rates were 4% on August 1st. So in 11 weeks, we've seen a 20% increase in 10 year rates while we've seen a 15% decline in bond prices. Something that's never supposed to happen. They're bonds, right? Think of type B personality, boring. They're not NVIDIA or Tesla, right? Think type A personality. There is nothing sexy about bonds, right? They shouldn't be, they shouldn't have such dramatic moves as they've had in such a short period of time. But it is what it is for now, right? It also tells you that rates are going to go higher still. Now, remember, I'm in the 6% terminal rate camp. I still think we got to go up 50 basis points from here. I think it's also telling us that the big mega cap divvy paying stocks, the ones that are supposed to offer you shelter in the storm, so think consumer staples and utilities, cannot at the moment keep up with the 5.5% yield in short duration treasuries or even the 4.68 uh, in the 10 year. And why is that? Well, in a nervous environment, investors do not want to own stocks just to collect the 3 or 4% dividend if they are at risk of losing their capital in the process. So what happens? Nervous investors all run for the door and they do it all at the same time. And boom, down we go right? You are starting to see some of the talking heads on the street advocate for holding cash, right? Selling stocks and holding cash rather than, rather than buying stocks. In fact, Double Line's Jeffrey Dunlap, he's a well-known type B bond trader, told investors on Tuesday that it's T-bills and chill. Okay, now look, let me remind you, there's nothing wrong with holding cash. No one gets fired for holding cash when you can collect 5%. But equity buyers are alive and well. They have to be. If not, who would the sellers be selling to? It is the buyers in this situation who are now in control of prices, right? Uh, this, because why? Because the sellers need the buyers. So the buyers get to price stocks. They get to say, no, nah, I'm not interested in paying 50 right now. If you're quick, I might pay you 48. And if you think about it too long, I'm going to drop my bid to 47, right? You see how they do this? You see how this works? They create this anxiety among the sellers, allowing them to take advantage of the anxiousness. But that creates long-term opportunities for them. And by the way, it's the same in the bond market, in the real estate market, and the retail market. Just think about the coming after Christmas sales that see retailers slash their prices by 30 or 40 or 50 percent they just get the merchandise out the door you can see the people lining up outside the store to do what take advantage of the sale right it's the same mentality in stocks but before you go bitching and complaining about the buyers consider what happens when the tone changes then it's the sellers who are in control, right? When the buyers start to get anxious because it gets to a level where now it's you know oversold and they're all trying to jump back in, the sellers turn the tables and they become the ones who control the prices, teasing the buyers by canceling their offers and raising their, their prices. All you have to do is remind yourself about what happened in the housing market over the past couple of years, right? A seller whose house might have been worth 500000 Put it on the market for six hundred thousand because the market was so hot, and he sells it for eight hundred thousand. I don't, I don't ever remember the sellers complaining about that when it happened. Do you? Yeah, I didn't think so, right? So it it works both ways, and that's what you have to remember when you're trying to, you know, not panic in a in an anxious situation. Which is why I say, don't go light your hair on fire. Don't go and panic unless, of course, you just don't crap. But if you have a well-thought-out plan and a portfolio, all you need to have is a strong stomach, 
right? Delete the noise. Watch what happens when stocks you own become dislocated only because of anxiety, not because there's been a fundamental change in the story, but only because sellers are panicking, right? Then you swoop in, you be strategic, then you put your money to work, right? Remember what Uncle Warren says, risk comes from not knowing what you are doing. Be greedy when others are fearful. Translation, buy the right stocks when they're throwing them out the kitchen window. That's when you want to be a buyer, right? Now, as you can imagine, the contra trades all did well yesterday. The VIX, which is the fear index, lunged ahead, ending the day up 12%, but not before teasing up 16%. The VIXI, which is the fear ETF, gained 9.3%. Very nice. While the SHP, SQ, and the DOG each gained 1.4, 1.8, and 1.3% respectively. And if you got long the SPSX, which is the triple levered S&P short, you were up four percentage points. Now, add in the stronger jolts report from yesterday, and all that tells you is that the job market remains hot, something that JJ does not want to see. And that number suggests that we can expect to see ongoing upward pressure on wages. Again, something JJ does not want to see, right? We have the ongoing UAW strike, right? They're striking for higher wages. And today, we're going to see hundreds of healthcare workers take to the streets, also striking for higher wages as well. Now, be sure that you understand the concept of this wage price spiral inflation that I've been talking about for months. That's a throwback to the 1970s when this happened the last time. Higher wages force higher prices, which force higher wages, right? Do you see the circularity there? Do you see the position JJ put us in because uh, rising prices in the spring of 2021 were only transitory, right? He dragged his feet for nine months. Oh boy, don't even make me go there. I haven't even finished my coffee yet. Can you imagine when I finish my cup of coffee? Okay, we're now just four weeks away from the next FOMC meeting. And before we get there, we're gonna have plenty of new data to add to the list, right? The most important being next week's CPI and PPI uh, due out uh, Wednesday and Thursday, I think. And they're expected to be elevated. The key will be if they are even higher than what the expectation already is, right? Now, U.S. futures this morning are churning, right? They're neither up or down, really. They're kind of trading the flat line. The Dow is up 32. The S&Ps were down two. The Nasdaq's down eight. The Russell's flat. Investors not only have to deal with the economic data points that, you know, continue to, to continue to create chaos, but they now, we now, we now have to deal with the stupidity on Capitol Hill. Republican Congressman Matty Gates toss a hand grade into the House chamber last night. He, along with seven other GOP members, jumped the fence and saddled up with the Democrats to throw House Speaker Kevin McCarthy out to the curb. So to be clear, it was 208 Democrats and eight Republicans that voted to oust McCarthy. So it was a 216 to 210 vote, leaving the House without a speaker for the first time in the history of this nation, handing the Democrats another victory. Because now... Matty Getz and the other seven Republicans are beholden to Hakeem Jeffries. They have succeeded in neutering the GOP. The action alone is the very reason for absolute term limits for the whole group. Again, while this won't price stocks in the long term, though, it does create drama. And drama creates the opportunity, right, in the short term. Ecodata today includes the services PMIs, right? We'll, go, we'll get the S&P and the ISM expected to be 50.2 and 53.5, leaving us both in expansionary territory. Mortgage apps, and then we're going to get ADP employment, which is expected to show a gain of 150,000 new jobs, along with factory orders and durable goods. In any event, we remain in that seasonally weak time of year, the, the September, October. So don't stress. Stick to your plan. Keep putting cash into the cash account of your long-term portfolio if it makes you feel better. We can always take a look at stocks in a couple of weeks when the, when the chaos kind of settles down. European markets, which all ended down more than 1.5% yesterday, are struggling to advance this morning. Stocks across the region are trying to shake off the weaker eco data, as well as deal with the rising bond yields. German yields are now, German bonds are now yielding 3%, while bonds from the mother country in Italy are yielding 4.8% for a 10-year and 5.2% for the 30-year. The S&P ended the day at 42.29, down 59 points. This after testing as low as 42.16. Keep your eyes on 4,200. It is a key level. A test there should hold. But if it doesn't, 
Then the algos are going to go into overdrive, sending wave after wave of sell orders that will cause the buyers to do what? Step aside, right? Because uh, in the end, the price is what you pay. Value is what you're going to get. And if they step aside, prices will fall further. And lower prices for quality stocks creates long-term value for the long-term investor. Gavish? Okay, so we are closer to 4,200 support than we are at the 4,385, which is resistance. Anxiety is up, stocks are down. Yields are up, bonds are down. Inflation is up, sentiment is down. There is chaos on Capitol Hill, and there's a hippie New York judge who just slapped Donnie with a gag order. Now that's funny. And speaking of Donnie, he's now in the running to replace Kevin McCarthy. Now that's hysterical. I mean, you can't even make this stuff up because who would ever believe that this is the state of affairs here in the United States. Remember, as a long-term investor, you need to eliminate the noise and stick to the plan, even when it makes you uncomfortable. The most important thing you can do right now is not panic. Okay, so I don't know. When it gets like this, I just I just like the pasta because it makes me feel good. I can't help myself. So I'm giving you another pasta recipe. This one is spaghetti fini, which is like thin spaghetti. Uh, we're going to serve this with leeks and pancetta and some cream in there. It's delicious. It's easy to make. Uh, and it presents beautifully on the dish. So for this, you need butter. You need olive oil, two medium leeks, chopped, right? You want to trim, um, trim the bottom of the leek, right, where the, where the root is, uh, and then take the top off and then trim the stock, right? You want salt and pepper. You want chopped fresh chives. You need the spaghetti. You need diced pancetta. You need heavy cream. You can use light if you want. I use heavy, and of course you need fresh grated Parmigiana of cheese. You're gonna bring a pot of salted water to a rolling boil on the back burner, leave it there so it's ready when you're ready. On, a meat, on medium heat, you're gonna take a big uh, saute pan, you're gonna melt the butter and a splash of olive oil just to keep the butter from burning, right? Now you're gonna add the leeks, you're gonna cook those, stirring occasionally just until they're softened, right? Uh, it's probably four to five minutes, maybe six minutes. You're gonna add the pancetta, saute that now for a couple of minutes, let the pancetta render off a little bit and cook up. When that's done, you're going to add the cream. You're going to turn it down to simmer. going to cover, keep it warm. Now you're going to add the pasta to the water, cook it till it's al dente, eight minutes or so. Uh, strain, but you're always going to save the pasta water. Don't throw it out. You're going to toss the pasta into the saute pan with the leek sauce and stir it to combine. Now, if it starts to suck up all the cream, add the water. Add a ladle of water to keep it moist. Now add the chives, toss it, and serve it immediately right? I always like fresh uh, parmigiana uh, cheese on the table with any pasta dish, so make sure that you always have that on the table for your guests. But you can also, when you put the pasta into the saute pan and you start to mix it, you know, take a handful of parmigiana cheese and toss it right in there too so it mixes as well, because then what it does, it'll, it'll mix, it'll melt, and it'll make the sauce even uh, creamier and delicious, and then you have the extra cheese on the table. You can't lose with that. I would enjoy this once again, because uh, it's a pasta, so I would enjoy this once again with either a light red uh, or a chilled white. Um, because it's all, it doesn't, doesn't take you down the wrong road at all. Uh, and you know me, uh, uh, for the white, I like the Pinot Grigio Santa Margarita. If you want a, a nice, a nice uh, light, lighter red, I would go with the Chianti or the Pinot Noir, something like that. In any event, uh, it is Wednesday here in South Florida. It was raining this morning when I got here, but it looks like it's trying to uh, clear up. I hope it does, because then I hope that suggests something about what the market will do today. Otherwise, brace yourself for more chaos ahead. In any event, until tomorrow, take good care.